the two extra speakers, the uh, two speakers who couldn't speak this morning, uh, being trying to fit, accommodate them at a later session. So whether we like it or not, we must finish at uh, two thir uh, sorry, it's <laughs> 3 30 uh, today. So um, I'd like to crack on if I could. And thank you very much for coming back uh, from lunch uh, prom promptly. Um, just want to say that there are, uh, there's the usual Slido stuff going on, and some, then there's some questions that you can send in for the speakers. I, I feel we'll we will have a lot of speak, uh, questions. Um, and uh, you see the, the, uh, the information there. Um, I also want to say that uh, uh, welcome, because uh, the, the, um, the, we were being live streamed to the Science Gallery in uh, Trinity, and also um, my own project, which I'll talk about in a second, is Connecting Nature. It's linked to um, numerous other nature-based solution projects around Europe, and I t contacted them, and they're putting out the message. So hopefully we're having viewers from around Europe watching this session as well on nature-based solutions, and they'll be keen to hear your opinion. These are guys doing research in this area, and they'll be keen to hear some of the concerns and, and questions that you have. And if we can't get through them today, which I, I doubt we can, we'll might be trying to arrange something at a later date um, uh, to do with uh, the, the, um, some issues you might have. Um, so, so my name is Marcus Collier. I'm at the uh, School of Natural Sciences in Trinity College, Dublin. Um, I'm not Jane and Matt Yvonne. I'm Marcus, I'm, the, I'm different. Uh, but I'm in the same school. I'm, I'm in botany, although I'm not a botanist, uh, like, like, which is one funny thing about our school. Um, and I'm running a, a Horizon 2020 project called Connecting Nature, which is, which is a 12 million euro nature-based solutions oriented uh, project. And it's one of, uh, I think, almost a dozen nature-based solution projects that are being run in the Horizon 2020 program at the moment. Either they're underway or they're about to start. And Europe is investing 185 or 186 million euro in nature-based solution research, but more importantly, innovating with nature-based solutions as opposed to doing the research, but also developing, taking things from prototypes through to the market and actually um, uh, developing the nature-based approach. Um, Michael D. Higgins talked about language this morning it was interesting, and we are, and this conference, of course, is, is, is based around, obviously, nature, and we hear a lot about nature being a problem, the problem of nature, the problem with nature, uh, the problem that nature gives us, the problem that we're giving nature. So nature-based solutions is an attempt to, to take some of aspects of that and try to look at nature as a potential solution. And uh, we're, 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 we're hoping, or we're, we're, we're aiming, not just at using nature as a form of technology, if you think of it like that, we're also looking at the co-benefits that come, the social and e ecological and economic benefits, actually addressing the three E's that um, uh, President Higgins mentioned, e economics, uh, ecology, and ethics, in, in many ways. So if we're thinking of nature as a technology, we then start to be able to say, well, how can we I think the awful word is exploit that, but how do we use that? It is, it is essentially in the same language and same areas, e ecosystem services and natural capital. Um, and, and Mary Kelly Quinn mentioned this morning as well, uh, she identified a lot of the issues um, relating to the, the uh, rivers and water quality in Ireland. So what we thought we would do is we would, since nature-based solutions is a huge, huge topic, it's, it's in cities, it's all over, it's roofs and drainage and all those sorts of things. We thought we would just have a session specifically looking at river catchments and rivers and water and nature-based solutions and look at what, are the, what, is, what is happening, what's happening in Ireland, what is the potential, and, and uh, give us some, some thoughts on that. So we have four speakers. Alan Sullivan is first up, um, and followed by Siobhan, Mary, Mary Burke, and, and Nethi uh, Gilligan. And we will be uh, hoping that everybody keeps to time. I'm looking at them now. And um, I'll, I'll uh, pass it over to you. So, Alan, if you'd like to. There you go. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Alan Sullivan. And uh, I suppose for the past 25 years, I've been involved in uh, river management and ecology. Um, I just want to say it's actually it's an honour and a privilege and quite humbling to stand here uh, today. Uh, I think like a lot of ecologists um, we maybe didn't come into this um, 
uh, conference uh, feeling great about ourselves. We see a lot of uh, damage every day in our lives. We witness a lot of damage. Um, and uh, sometimes it's hard to motivate oneself to, um, uh, to see the, the future. Um, and I think the last day and a half have certainly motivated me. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm going to discuss um, basically ecological engineering um, on, on river systems. This is a very practical view of just what we do. I'm not really going to go into the, the hardcore theory of it. Um, I'm actually going to start with constraints um, because it is important to understand that the natural um, processes and fluvial processes within a river um, are entirely natural. If, I mean, if we've all looked at, if we looked at an aerial view of a river system, we can see that that river has moved progressively back and forth across its floodplain over hundreds of years, so they are not a static system. But what we are seeing today is, as I will mention, due to um, increased drainage, afforestation, um, well, particularly commercial afforestation, um, there is no attenuation or very little attenuation left. Our hydrograph is going up and down in 24 hours, where it was taking maybe 72 hours uh, 40 or 50 years ago. And of course, the, the increase then is in conveyance, and that has increased the tractive force of the river and its ability to do damage and cause erosion, loss of land, loss of habitat, siltation of, you know, there, there's a whole range of knock-on effects. But it is important to understand that you know, high banks, eroding banks, are important for, uh, for sand martens. Uh, there's a whole range of different species that live within those particular environments, so it's not just a one-size-fits-all scenario. So what is soft engineering as opposed to hard engineering? Um, as I said here, the use of ecological principles and practices to reduce erosion, achieve the stabilization and safety of riparian and in-stream habitats while enhancing habitat improving aesthetics, saving money, and sequestering CO2. There is, thankfully, a, a, a merging of, of thought processes between engineers uh, and biologists. I mean, I, I came at this from the position of a biologist. I have no formal training in engineering, and that's worked against me more than I could possibly begin to imagine, because um, we don't speak the same language, and we as biologists looked at this, and, 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 and we had to come up with different solutions uh, to assist in these problems. And these problems, that are these, what I'm going to show you today, they blend in naturally with buffer systems. They do protect land. They, um, they also are very good systems for working with farmers. Um, you, we, we've done a lot of work on the Dinan River uh, as a tributary of the Noor. Um, and it was the farmers that came to us. They were losing so much land, and they actually formed their own action group to talk about how. And in the past, the first thing they used was cars. They, the whole banks were lined with cars, engine blocks, oils, everything compressed into the banks, and that was their mechanism of stabilizing the banks. Then they moved on to the slatted shed offshoots from concrete factories, and they're littered all over rivers in Ireland, as seen as a mechanism of, of, of bank protection. We have sheet piling that goes on in all our canals, concrete walls, um, and, and it's, it's, it's incredible to see the damage that hard engineering structures do within river systems, particularly at the transition points and how the banks unravel, or even sending energy across the river and destroying the neighbour's land. And it's a bit like a drug. Once you start in one corner, it then tends to everybody else has to do it because they're losing so much land. Um, and as I say, there is a connection. Civil engineering, uh, Institute of Civil Engineers are beginning to recognize that this is an absolute necessary requirement. Uh, I'm going to flick through these quite quickly. This is the River Dynan, um, high energy tributary um, of the River Noor. And uh, one or two singular events. Um, 30 feet of ground gone to that particular farmer, but it was a very, very constant eroding situation. And the, the funny thing is that one farmer loses, the other farmer gains. And the number of fights, because the land is going this way, 
and they're actually gaining an acre and the guy over here is losing an acre. But the funny thing is then he loses an acre down here and the other guy gains one. So uh, it's a good way of, of communicating, let's just say, of how to um, uh, get people together. This particular incident, the, the, the river is in phenomenally high energy. Anybody that knows this river knows it's a very, very dynamic system, high gradient system. So we did have to use a little bit of rock armor uh, to secure, and I'll show you why we have to use it in, in, in the future. But this structure here had a 25 and a 50 year flood event over it. Um, you can see that the river has gone from a very, very wide. It was over 60 meters wide. It's gone back to its, its original um, morphological uh, shape. But you can actually see that the, uh, the clay on the bed of the river, the energy was so great at that particular point that it, it, it actually cleaned the bed of the river off and, and exposed the boulder clay uh, underneath. But it has stabilized very, very well. And we have records going back to work we did in 2004, the whole way through. And these systems, they might, um, sorry, they might, um, they, they might get little flaws in them. Uh, uh, things might break, and there might be holes in the bank here and there. But very, very rarely do they do you get a complete failure. Um, so our next uh, project example. This is a wee bit more commercial. This is the Greenway in Castle Bar, um, and uh, sorry, excuse me. And uh, so the Greenways have been a, an incredible success around Ireland, bringing people into uh, wilder areas. But a lot of them were built along areas, and certain weights were put on banks that they just weren't structurally able to um, uh, withstand. The Castle Bar River is not a high energy river particularly, but the, the, the banks started collapsing where, where the Greenway was, was put in. They were going to go for a hard engineer's solution. Um, thankfully, we had a very uh, forward thinking architect in the area. He called us, we had a chat with him, came down. And we've actually started quite a, uh, we've done quite a lot of work in the Castle Bar area as a result of the first project we did there about 10 years ago. Um, so we use a lot of geocore, which is coconut husk, uh, broken down the fibers, woven into a mesh, incredibly strong. Um, it breaks down over 10 or 12 years and actually acts as a fertilizer uh, for the, the willow and, um, and the, the, the other species that will actually colonize it. I have to add here that we do use willow that is hybridized. We don't use it live anymore. We actually put it in desiccated and we actually uh, put native slips throughout the, the structure. Um, this is one of the last structures that we did. It wasn't on an SAC river of hybridized willow, but we've since gone back in and, and actually planted the area up with uh, indigenous um, native from the immediate vicinity. The, you can see uh, the structures, I mean, that's May 2016, and that's what it looked like uh, eight weeks later. So it just gives you an example of how quick, uh, and structurally these uh, are, are very, very sound. They, they'll put up with a, a very large flood event uh, over them within a week. Um, and that's one of the key things about working in, in that particular environment. Um, as I say, failure mechanisms. Um, when it goes wrong, it goes spectacularly wrong like this. And weirdly enough, when the bank did collapse in this instant, um, it stayed. It, it just slumped and stayed like a, a, a lot of banks. When they collapsed, they actually naturally regrade themselves. Um, but it collapsed because we didn't use sufficient um, riprap or put a, a sufficient uh, rock armor toe in to protect the structure. So there is a little bit of um, what we call hybridization between pure soft engineering um, and, and, and hard engineering. Um, we've worked at looking at added, this was a Gas Networks Ireland project where the Cork to Dublin pipeline in the 1980s was put in by um, uh, open uh, cut uh, across the river. They use sheet piling on either side, and the banks have since disintegrated, and the bed disintegrated because of the sheet piles and the energy transfer. We can also incorporate sand nesting boxes, uh, sand martin nesting boxes, otter holts. You know, we've looked at a whole range of different um, applications uh, to um, to fit into the structures uh, as, as well. There's a massive difference in price uh, from soft engineered revetments to, to hard engineered revetments. Um, 
and again, and carbon sequester uh, is, 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 is relatively good as well. Um, other applications that we utilise, uh, I did a study on the NOR in 2008 looking at barriers. Uh, that's a fine example of where um, our Ferraris of the fish world weren't even getting into the areas in green, never mind uh, our lamprey species, never mind juveniles or anything else. And that's just a snapshot of, of two and a half thousand square miles of catchment. This is one little tributary on the catchment. Um, and two weeks later, we had it looking like that. And that's just maintaining connectivity. No concrete, no man-made materials in there at all. It's mimicking the natural gradient of river systems and uh, employing a diversity of habitats within uh, this, this structure. This is Boland's Weir in the Kings River. Um, and again, uh, very simple to do. Um, not doesn't cost a, a, an enormous amount of money, but we're getting full volitional movement, but again, using ecological engineering techniques. Um, and I'd like to thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, very interesting indeed. I was actually thinking it was Vim and Alice is the, is, it must be the willow that was being used there, the basket willow, uh, the hybridized. Yeah, I thought I was just wondering what. It was. Um, uh, thank you very much. So our next uh, talk will be from uh, Siobhan Thompson. And just uh, there you go. Thanks. <coughs> so I'm going to start by just introducing myself. I'm Siobhan. I work with Bernie. Some of some of you might be at this be, have been at the session she chaired yesterday. We're the local authority water program office. We're in existence now for the past three years. And we have a science team and a community team working under the programme. We, we were originally called the Local Authority Waters and Communities Office, and we've changed our name since then, since we recruited the scientists. So when Hannah asked me to come and talk at this, what she asked me to talk about was what communities are doing. And I started back at the basics, the Water Framework Directive. It sets out to establish a framework for community action in the field of water policy. And I'm not making that up. There's my copy of the Water Framework Directive and it's there at the top of the page. And it also sets out that um, water is a heritage and must be protected, and that's something that we always have to be mindful of. So when I started in the job originally, I did a desktop review of funding sources that were there at the time for water type projects. So I looked at leader funding, uh, fisheries, local action groups funding for the coastal areas, local agenda 21 administered by the councils, um, the Heritage Council funding, IFI, Waterways Ireland. They were the main funding sources for water type projects, but none of them had a water quality focus. And I had to go through them all thoroughly to see what, what projects were funded and which ones were in any way water or water amenity focused. So there was a gap. There wasn't um, enough money there to fund water type projects. So a submission went into the department, um, prepared by myself and Fran Igo, and um, we were given sanction for a community water development fund. It started last year, and we got 104 applications into the fund. And this year, the deadline was last week, and we've received 151 applications. So I have the badge bogged down on me. <laughs> um, so just to, to give you the answer to what kind of local actions communities are undertaking, predominantly it's that blue box, which you mightn't be able to read, but it says education and awareness raising. So that's the space that communities are in. They're not really in that natural flood relief measures space properly yet. And a lot of the types of groups that would have applied were tidy towns groups, little biodiversity groups. They're not, like the, the Rivers Trust are in the early stages yet. So they're giving, we're giving them seed capital to get going to try and mobilize them. So there's a lot to be done in the space of um, getting communities going. So. Um, so the education awareness type projects were workshops, outdoor classrooms, uh, small streams characterization training courses, schools engagements, engagement with anglers, uh, tidy towns groups, talks and walks, uh, cleanups and uh, wildlife boxes and bird feeders. Uh, one group actually gave them funding to buy a marquee, which turned out to be a very good project because we can use the marquee, our community water officer can use the marquee whenever she wants. So they were all very good projects. And one of them was actually here yesterday at the community award. He was shortlisted. Tipperary Tidy Towns got a sh shortlisted for the project that they did in the school, bringing the, the children down to the river. 
Uh, there was a lot of uh, applications in for signage. This group did a lovely biodiversity signage, and they did another sign in the park, and they did another sign, and they did a little bit of Facebook um, plugging, and then they did another sign. So that was one group doing four signs. Obviously, community groups feel that there's a need for signage. Um, uh, there were some lovely publications, like Capper Wetlands did a beautiful publication about the wetlands, and we also match funded a project that they had submitted to Leader for an accessible uh, boardwalk through the wetlands. Um, there was a lot of surveys, studies, assessments, and reports funded as well. Um, we may not have given them the full amount, but we gave them what we could. So groups are at the early stages, and they need to have a plan. And without a plan, they're never going to succeed. Um, there was three uh, video clips and short films. The one there on introducing freshwater invertebrates is a really nice little two-minute clip uh, if you ever wanted to show it in a classroom. Um, that's Catherine Seal there, that lady, she's one of our staff based in Galway. And um, the bottom one then is one of the, a group that were um, a disadvantaged youth project in Cork and where the children monitored the river for four, for four weeks. And that's just kind of their progress, it charts the development of the project and what they benefited from, how they benefited from it. Um, there was leaflets and flyers produced on flood management and natural water retention measures and woodland for water. So that was done up in the north of the country by Inish Owen Rivers Trust. Um, there was a bit of stream rerouting and opening up of river and tree planting. So they were kind of the, the, the measures, those types. There was very few project applications like that that were a good enough standard that would have passed the, the IFI's kind of um, permissions of going in stream to do works and the group's capacity as well. Uh, there's a couple of construction of wetlands. Uh, there's a big project in Shannon that it hasn't been completed yet, but that, that was the biggest project application for 25,000 euro. And there was, sorry, Alan, there was a lovely wall <laughs> repaired. <laughs> and if I had known Alan was going to give such a lovely presentation, and if I had, <laughs> I might have referred the group on to you. So I, I think I'll know for, um, for this year that maybe that could be a possibility that they should look at um, different options of reinstatement. Because to be honest, I wouldn't have been fully aware of the softer measures, so your presentation was very beneficial for us all. Uh, there was uh, some invasive species projects where groups went out and they pulled the invasive species or they injected it. Um, a few very successful projects there. There was one sciencey project where a group put down a remote monitoring system um, where the, the system can give uh, warnings if there's uh, in variations in uh, the pH levels. Um, there, then within our office, we do a lot of events and publications around the area to engage communities. Uh, we rolled out a Tidy Towns Networking for Nature event last year up the country. It was held in Longford and Sligo and Cavan. And community groups were particularly um, interested in attending that event because um, we had a judge there from the Tidy Towns to talk about the, um, the new category of wildlife and biodiversity. And like yesterday with the awards, communities need incentives. It's not all about money. They like to get awards as well. They need grants, they need capacity. And they turned up in their droves because that speaker was there because they all want to get their points in the tidy towns. So it's, it's a big area to get in on. Um, up the country again, we ran a slow the flow um, uh, event and uh, we produced River Action Plan guidance document and we're also in the process of producing um, a, a how to, who to go to document and the permissions that you need and the types of works that can be done. Um, uh, in 2017, we went to the Heritage Council and uh, asked them would they consider a Water Heritage Day as an annual event. So Water Heritage Week runs the last week in August. So now the fourth Sunday of August is dedicated to Water Heritage Day. And we have a budget of 10,000 euro to run events throughout the country. One per county is our target. And they're just little kick sampling projects or try out fishing or a talk or a walk or biodiversity in nature, any kind of um, a workshop that can be run. Actually, Aina Olauna did a few events for us last year. She did talks where she brought the children out. Uh, we have developed linkages with the tidy towns, with the local authority, uh, with the Waters and Communities Special Award. There's special awards categories in the tidy towns, and the groups are particularly interested in that because they're trying to score the points under the wildlife and biodiversity. So they apply for that award, and it's co-sponsored by ourselves, IFI and Waterways Ireland. Um, so that's, that's my presentation. Um, I just thought this was a nice quote to end on. And it came across very strongly yesterday that we need to educate people and educating them is at the space we're still at, I think. 
And just having a quick screening of the applications that have come in this year under the Community Water Development Fund, a lot of them, again, are education and awareness raising type projects. So it, it goes back to Confucius, the old philosopher, has a lovely saying there, but the one I remember from my childhood is, um, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you teach him for a lifetime. So it's, it's a slow process and I think we will get there eventually. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Um, I, I, one of the aspects of nature-based solutions, the co-benefits, is, is relates to education and awareness and health and well-being. And it's one of the few areas, or one of the main areas, where we actually have very little data, little experience. And just looking at all of the, um, the, um, the ex examples there, it's quite a, a, a large field to, to, to do work in. I have to say, I, I feel slightly responsible. I was the, in 1998, I was the one who wrote the guidelines for Tidy Towns Biodiversity <laughs> Competition. I was asked to do that, um, um, by the, and uh, I think I put in a tremendous amount of things about awareness and <laughs> that sort of thing, so sorry. Uh, but it seems to be taking hold. Um, our third speaker now is Mary Burke. I would just like to ask her to come up. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm uh, Mary Burkham from the Department of Geography in Trinity College Dublin and I'm going to speak to you today about a new initiative that we're beginning in Trinity um, to deal with the issue of uh, floods in Ireland and it's called Natural Water Retention Measures. So if I could have my slides or are they? Great. So what is Natural Water Retention Measures? What are they? Well, they're, they're green infrastructure and they have multi functional aspects to them. Um, and they can uh, help us in trying to alleviate some of the uh, catchment scale flood risks uh, that we experience here in Ireland. And um, what I want to focus in today is on multifunctional. Um, I'm speaking to an audience that's interested in biodiversity, not an audience that's primarily interested in floods. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about these multifunctional um, aspects. In essence, what we're trying to do is keep the water in the landscape for longer. We are not flooding farmers' lands, farmers' uh, uh, livelihoods. We're talking about retaining the water, slowing the flow for between 12 and 24 hours, just keeping it where it is, just for a little bit longer. I lived in Australia for quite a while, and they had this great phrase of do what you can where you are with what you've got. And that is underpinning this approach to, to uh, nature-based solutions and water management. We have a landscape that has a natural topography, and it's about looking at that topography and seeing opportunities where we can delay the connectivity of floodwaters in that landscape naturally, sustainably and naturally. So here's one of the examples. If you look um, on the left here, we're looking at, uh, on, the, on, your, on your left, we're looking at uh, leaky dams. Now, leaky dams are dams that are designed to leak, highly counterintuitive. They're using natural uh, materials, such as these uh, native uh, species that have been uh, locally uh, cut down. During um, a flood event, or a flow event, these dams will basically have water uh, standing behind them for longer periods of time. So we're looking at, perhaps, um, a damming of the water here that might be in the order of 20 seconds, just slowing it a little bit. And the idea is that you have a large number of these small interventions dispersed around the catchment. They are low risk and they are low cost and they are effective. In looking at peatlands, and again, this idea of working with nature, working with what you've got, um, we know that particularly in Scotland, in terms of um, trying to restore and rehabilitate peatlands, they have combined this approach with dealing with flood problems. And they've put in these um, natural turf dams, or bits of peat across, at frequent intervals that store the water and then um, allow um, the water to infiltrate into the peat itself, but also slowing that and lowering that flood peak. And I'm delighted to say that uh, at Trinity, um, the Provost Prize, and along with um, the um, uh, our uh, partners at National Parks and Wildlife, so we're beginning a project uh, this year to look at the potential of Irish peatlands for uh, this particular approach in slowing down the flow. 
One of the things that we tried to do, and um, that was peatlands, we're looking at um, reconnecting rivers with their own floodplains. The floodplains belong to the rivers. The floodplains were built by the rivers. And through a series of arterial drainage network schemes, we have cut off that connectivity between the river and its own floodplain. Ireland is a system, uh, a geomorphic system, a terrain system, where we actually have a lot of low gradient river systems. And naturally in those systems are these broad floodplains that have all of these paleo channels, former pathways of the river itself that are these natural lower topographies in the floodplains. And what we would aim to do was reconnect the river with its own former pathways so that when it floods, it basically can put that extra flood water in its own paleo channel and it's going the long way around and come back into the river, slowing the flow. Forests are another area that we're tackling in terms of looking at the potential of forested uh, lands for uh, natural water retention measures. Now, of course, there's loads of different types of forests. You can have whole catchment styles, you can have smaller belts, you can have uh, floodplains and riparian woodlands. Um, what's interesting, I suppose, to this audience is that not only do they provide um, ecosystem benefits in terms of floods, but there's all of these other benefits in terms of habitats, climate regulation, low flows, aesthetic quality, etc. So working hand in hand with these natural water retention measures, we're, giving, um, we're providing a space for other additional ecosystem services to thrive. So we have co-benefits from uh, biodiversity down to reduce soil erosion. And again, I'm delighted to announce that this year we've just received an IRC PhD scholarship in partnership with the OPW, that agency, that government agency that's been given um, the, uh, the role of helping us with our flood problem. And so we're going to look at forested areas in particular with the OPW to look at how um, we can um, in integrate natural water retention measures in forested areas. And then we come to agricultural land. Agriculture has featured very heavily in this conference. Um, and talking about how we can work with farmers and with communities to uh, increase our uh, um, biodiversity benefits. Now, I think many of us in this room will have seen this. We have, will have seen dirty water on our uh, farming, uh, uh, our rural roads. And this is, what this is showing you is that the soil, the water, the nutrients, the uh, hidden world of microbial systems is all being washed off the land um, out onto the road and down into the river systems. And this is a negative outcome in terms of uh, um, rainfall on uh, agricultural land that's been freshly ploughed. An example of where uh, natural water retention would come in and help this would be the construction of this earthen bond in the corner of a ploughed field that would retain the water to a certain point. And then it has an outflow pipe where the excess water would then be draining off out of this... Um, uh, soft engineered um, uh, earthen dam and so you're retaining the soil and you're retaining the nutrients and so it's having an impact not only on flood waters but also on uh, water quality. So the essence is to reduce and enhance catchment processes, the ones that, we, that have been affected by uh, human intervention, with the ideal to reduce flood hazard, either by planting trees, by using floodplains that exist and just storing the water there for a little bit longer, or producing these leaky dams from natural materials, sustainable approaches to managing the floods. Does it work? Yes, it does. So here's some data from the UK. This is a, a catchment, uh, the Stroud catchment, and the green graph here is the flood hydrograph. So this is the amount of water on uh, your right-hand side there, and on the bottom is time. So quite a, um, a, a flashy kind of flood in 2012. And after that flood in 2012, they decided to adopt natural water retention uh, measures approach, and they installed uh, 280 uh, interventions in their catchment. And this is the resultant flood peak in 2016, with very similar initial conditions in terms of the rainfall input. Now, this is a small catchment, and so it has been demonstrated quite strongly that this approach works for small catchments, but does it work for large catchments, and does it work for big floods? Well, simply you'll hear that it doesn't, but that we don't know. The data has not been collected. It's been modelled and suggested that it doesn't work, but it's not been proven. We need data on the larger catchments and the bigger floods. And Ireland is heading for a bit of a, a troubling time in, in terms of our climate change. We have here um, an analysis of rainfall records that's showing that basically the areas in blue 
and brown represent areas where uh, the soil will reach saturation point both earlier and later in our season. Therefore, we're going to have a longer flooding season um, in Ireland as a result. Now, what does that mean? Well, we can look at a, uh, an area in Donegal, the Inishowen Peninsula, that in the month of August, you can see here the blue on this graph is this cumulative rainfall. Basically, the amount of rain that fell in that month of August exceeded the mean quite dramatically. So that means that all of the land was saturated, the soil was saturated, so its capacity to absorb water was reduced. So you had um, areas of standing water in fields like this. Then we had an offshoot depression from a hurricane cross the Inishowen Peninsula, Hurricane Gertrude. And it brought the highest daily rainfall, 77 millimetres, um, fell on that day. And so we had a condition where not only um, was the water saturated, but even if it had been a drought-like year like we've had in the last year, it fell so intensely that basically we, um, that's my own timer, that it fell so intensely that the water wouldn't have had time to penetrate and uh, get into it. And so as a result, Carn Dunna and other areas in the Inishowen Peninsula were absolutely devastated by this event. We had uh, extensive inundation of agricultural land, we had landslides into people's homes and on farmlands, and we had damage to infrastructure. Now, will it work? Will natural water uh, retention measures work for the big floods? Well, we don't know. But I would say that that's not actually where our energy should be diverted. We have floods of many different magnitudes in Ireland. We have small floods that occur frequently and large floods that occur less frequently. It's been shown now in a concept developed in the United States, this concept of nuisance floods. These are the ones that come up and flood um, your driveway or, or block a road and you can't get to work um, or somehow inconvenience um, uh, lots of economies. And if you have more of those floods happening that have a cost associated with them, they will sum total up to being a more expensive type of flood than the big one that happens in the so-called 1% flood or 100 years. So I would suggest that natural uh, retention measures will benefit these kinds of floods and in such will benefit bigger floods just by the natural presence on the land. So um, this is the beginning of a project. We have funding from the EPA, thankfully, and we have lots of agencies uh, combining with us uh, to help us move on this. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Mary. Um, and uh, there you go. And uh, I'd like to welcome our, our final speaker. Speaking of the OPW, uh, we're going to have a presentation now. Thank you. I'll set a timer here like Mary as well, because we're all on the clock, basically. Um, uh, Marcus, thanks very much. As introduced, uh, my name is Nathan Gilligan. I'm head of environment section for the Office of Public Works, mainly on the Fudra's manager side. Um, so, so today, just talk about maybe how we're integrating, or how OPW are integrating nature into Fludra's management to give you a feel for basically the natural, national picture of where things stand on that agenda at the moment in Ireland. Three areas we look at is uh, various scales. First of all, is these ongoing operations, drainage maintenance operations, ongoing state every day. There's a whole pile, a whole framework of flood relief schemes, large scale schemes coming down the tracks in Ireland. And then this idea of maybe some of these catchment solutions, where we're kind of going with this flood in nature and kind of approach at a bigger scale in Ireland. So first of all, just the drainage maintenance, um, these ongoing operations, I won't waste people's time, but people don't realise how much work's going on. There's um, machines working in Irish rivers every day on these maintenance operations. So the top left there will be up in the buoying, catching the machine coming down, working away. This will be in Galway, machine working away with specialised cutting equipment for taking out with aquatic weeds. Machines down here in Limerick working on flood, flood defences outside Limerick. So as part of that then, there's a, there is an environmental system in around, well developed over the years around all this maintenance type of works. It does have an ethos of continuous improvement and it does strive to try and get the balance with nature, but that's assuming when the machine goes into an Irish river, what's the best way to approach it? So our recent publication is this new environmental guidance produced by OPW. We literally haven't formally launched it yet, but it's gone up on the OPW website. But it's meant to be just a practical thing. If a machine goes into an Irish River, this is best practice, what you need to do, what you need to consider. And it is an important national standard. It will spill out to a lot of other public authorities and help them out as well. 
uh, just the sample procedures in it. This is kind of for drivers, for machine drivers out in the Irish countryside showing a driver. If you come along a drained river in Ireland, it's full of aquatic vegetation. Rather than taking it all out, you're expected to go out the middle centre, keep the channel open, but leave, leave space, leave a barge of vegetation each side to keep space for nature as well. So to try and get that balance between nature and the drainage capacity of the channel. Other initiatives, just to show quickly, there's other things we've mentioned, maybe Alan mentioned about barrier work. Just as other initiatives go on, we've worked for years with fisheries on the National Barrier Improvements. This is a machine here down the Limerick area, basically breaching a weir, partially moving a weir to, to improve river continuity under the Water Framework Directive as part of the Mulcair Life Project. And that's turned into kind of quite a large scale national programme of barrier removal has now been opened up in Ireland, stemming from a lot of work OPW and fisheries have done over the last 10 or 20 years together. Other, uh, other angles we're looking at all the time, new initiatives such as this Meander Connect Research Project. We're just starting off seeing we're going to go, but this would be a typical drained river in Ireland. We've searched the country looking for where we can find all meanders still in the Irish landscape. And the next option now is maybe start, start talking to landowners or other groups to see how can we look at maybe possibly reconnecting some of these meanders. It's only at initial stages ourselves and fisheries are starting to move it forward quietly until we get to kind of find our feet on it. But we are going to, have to bring in to make it work, we're going to, have to bring more partners on board. But interesting little angle of what's going on behind the scenes. The other second area we want to look at is just these floodery schemes. These are the big infrastructure schemes in the Irish state. Traditionally, this is the structural option. These are schemes that are ongoing in Ireland, either done or on, ongoing. This is maybe a scheme widening the channel down through Crockwell and County Galway, basically increase the heights of the walls, going through Innes on the Fergus, basically excavating the whole channel, dredging the Bandon River, bringing the floods to Bandon Town. These are the kind of type of engineering operations that are going on. Um, in saying that, the design ethos is continuously changing and evolving. This would be very typical of a lot of towns now, Formoy, Mallow, Clamel, all of these demountable barriers. It's kind of halfway between engineering, software engineering, and hardware engineering. This is the Dodder in Dublin, there's a some floodgates are used. So the, the person walking along here, all the, when the big flood comes down the Dodder through Dublin, the public footpaths are closed off. All these big gates are closed to stop the properties flooding. Uh, but, but at least when non-flood scenarios, you allow people access along the river as best as we can. It's continuously, it's continuously evolving as so well the design ethos within OPW. Uh, this is the Kilty down in Cork. Uh, it's hard to see it, there's a map here. It's basically a combination of maybe non-structure and structural. There's basically a flood, a flood embankment has been built upstream of the town, so most of the water is going to be stored upstream of the town, but there is a certain amount of walls in through Clonakilty to protect the town itself. And we're trying to maximise wherever we can keep this approach going. The diagram up here is actually the M50, that blue line, that's the time in park on the M50. So as part of the Poddle flood relief scheme down to South Dublin, we're looking serious at seeing can we, can we flood some of time and park to maybe help reduce the level of flood walls down through the Dublin city maybe. So we'll see if it looks likely that it might be an option. If it is works, if it is feasible, we will go with it. Um, that's the floodery scheme. The last section to look at is this broad idea of catchments where we're going. Mary's touched a lot on it already, we'll say. Um, like when we're talking about kind of flood nat natural flood management, like what is it? Designing to renaturalise the catchment, this kind of newer concept. You're effectively reducing, reducing the flood by using more natural methods to slow down the flow, as Mary's saying. And the big winner here is a potentially big winner is biodiversity. There could be huge gain here if this agenda goes the right way. Uh, it's a different terms used, people get used to it, and people get confused at all the different terms. Ireland and the European Commission tend to use the word natural water retention measures. The UK tend to use workable natural processes, and Scotland tend to use natural flood management. But ultimately, we're all talking about the same thing when it boils down. Uh, there's the EU Commission website. They have a lot of information on their own website, natural flood man and natural water retention measures.eu. There's various guidance, case studies, and so as part of the kind of push to try and encourage all member states to maximise this approach. Just in Ireland, I suppose, kind of come back to what Mary was saying about where we stand or what level of knowledge or Ireland's knowledge at the moment. Cork is probably the best one. There's a massive scale a scheme being planned for Cork. It has been looked at. Could you reduce or not go ahead with such big defences in Cork by reflooding some lands upstream or using these measures? So we have looked at, in theory, putting in 5,000 small overland flows interventions across the whole league catchment. Now, it is a modelling, kind of quite a detailed model, but it really concluded that to re by reducing the 100-year flood in Cork, all it will reduce is either between a half a percent and four and a half percent maximum that you end up with the walls in Cork with the same heights, even if you build 5,000 structures up in the league catchment. So that's where we're kind of stuck at the moment in terms of, that's for a large flood, as well as a large catchment, we can't see to make it viable. In saying that, they look at the UK and other areas, Mary's alluded to this as well. This is maybe for a medium-sized catchment, maybe a medium-sized flood in the UK. Pickering is quite a famous place in the UK. 
to have a big engineering storage system in the middle of the design, similar to Clonakilty, but they have used a whole selection of more natural approaches to reduce the flow, and indications are from the recent storms in the UK, it has worked, or these measures have helped reduce it. But they're talking maybe a 25-year defence level rather than a 100-year defence level, so at some stages the houses are going to get flooded. But it does work to a certain element. I suppose how we're pressing this in Ireland to keep this agenda moving. Everyone, there's been a lot of talk to a lot of public authorities, everyone's very aware. Like, we're all starting to come around the same way, thinking of integrated catch and management. It's now been formally adopted under the Water Framework Directive for, for Ireland's implementation that we're going to set up a working group for this. There's a whole pile of agencies, everyone agrees, we're all going to join the same working group. Uh, EPA, OPW, housing, culture, agriculture, forestry, fisheries, everyone agrees this is the best way to drive the agenda forward. And ultimately, we need to find some sort of pilots, as Mary said, is at the moment we're kind of hydraulic model or modelling things, we need to get pilot catchments going in Ireland somehow with all this. And in saying that, was also, as Mary said, there's a lot of research that started up. There's this kind of half million funded, funded project for research in OPW EPA that Trinity College are leading called Slow Flows. There's a, we're starting up a doctorate with Trinity College on slowing flows to do with forestry. And we've mentioned Inish Owen, Inish Owen uh, River Trust, quite an active group. So we're giving them some seed funding themselves. They're looking at how could they maximise natural water retention measures as part of the River Trust work. So there's a number of factors moving along. Um, the future role, like where we see it at the moment, like natural water retention measures, they seem to be able to work for smaller catchments, smaller floods. They seem to have limited ability to manage the bigger catchments and the bigger floods. Uh, but they will complement like flood storage and defences, some natural measures in through it, like they've done in the UK, have potential to give benefit. They will help buffer as well as we go forward to climate change, more extreme weather events coming. If we can soften the catchments, it will prepare Ireland better for these more extreme storms coming. And like ought to be everyone agrees, these win-win projects for the environment society, they are the ideal way forward if there's some way we can make them work in Ireland. So in summary, really, we've looked at the operations side, these ongoing operations. There is environmental guidance, a lot of work done to try and minimise the impact of machines working in Irish rivers. There is the whole system of flood re schemes, the whole design philosophy of that is continuously evolving, becoming softer and softer slowly but surely. And then there's the whole bigger agenda these, how can we get Ireland to these win win catchment scale projects where everyone works together for the benefit of the river? That's the ultimate future agenda where we're going. And thanks very much. That's the end of my presentation. Actually, if you want to stay here, uh, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, first of all, my sincere gratitude to everybody for keeping to time. Um, it's given us uh, enough time at the end of the session. I know it's a very brief session and it's very, only a flavour of what we could be talking about, but it's given us a bit of time for some questions. So there has been some questions coming in through the, uh, the Slido, but um, first of all, I'd like to open it up to the floor uh, for some questions. And if you could just say your, your name um, and uh, affiliation, if you wish, um, before you ask the question. Yeah, just... um, <clears throat> something similar on this came up at the, the, the talk before lunch and I mentioned that one of the problems is that the, in development plans the distance from development to rivers is sometimes 10 metres. For example in the, the, the Time and Park area mm -hmm. this house is built up to 10 metres from the river which uh, in the river puddle. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the, the puddle is flooding. Now, one of the ways to get out of this with the nature-based solution is that if you, in the urban areas, if you increase the size of parks along rivers, now this is a new development, obviously, then you can allow for flooding without taking away from um, ruining sports fields or woodlands or recreation, other recreation areas like playgrounds and that. But that is another option that should be thought of. The development plans all over the country need to be changed to reflect a wider setback from the rivers. I know that the, I think the fisheries people talk about 25 metres. I've seen 50 metres and others. There's one park out in Lucan where the the, um, the river Griffin flooded a number of years ago because the houses were built too close. And I looked at it one time. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm the next yeah. parks person in South Dublin County Council. I'm retired now. But one of the things that we looked at was setting back 100 or 200 metres from the riverbank to allow for flooding, to allow for recreation or whatever, 
and using parks to do that. So that, that so is another nature-based so solution. Is, who, would anyone like to address that, or is that more of a comment? Would, would the OPW be in favor of more parks in, in, in favor yeah. <laughs> in urban areas, or would that solve the Clonmel or Cork issue in We'd, some uh, respects that you were talking about upstream? It is beneficial. Like a lot of the times, we can't make these options feasible. So scheme mm -hmm. design goes into an area. Usually, the lie of the land, we can't get enough area to store it. It usually takes a lot of land, we find. But like obviously, the more space you have, it does increase your options. Or yeah. even as Mary's saying, do some sort of combination effect where you can store parts of foot maybe. And then it. linked to that question is the removal there of the Arterial Drainage Act. Um, has anyone, Mary, did you, would you be in favour of or maybe altering the arterial drainage yes. act. Uh. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that that's this idea of, speaking as a fluvial geomorphologist, this idea of getting the water off the land as quickly as possible is exacerbating the flood issue that we have. Right. And you combine that with um, our historical, our very old uh, dwellings, villages and stuff that are built very close to a river. Maybe when they were built, the river wasn't there, perhaps. I mean, I think there's a lot of different approaches. It's not a matter of how far. You have to model where the flood waters go. It could be 10, it could be 110 feet or meters or whatever. It depends on what that river is producing in terms of a flood. That will dictate, the data will dictate the distance it should be set back. But there are also a lot of ways in which households can take responsibility for dealing with floods themselves. This idea that um, I've come back to Ireland recently as an immigrant and I have found there's a narrative in Ireland that speaks to, you fix that for me, it's your fault, and maybe it is, but basically they can't fix it all, and you have to take on the responsibility to protect your own property. I've spoken to people in the Inishon Peninsula that have gone out and bought the, the, the doors that will protect their households now when the, river, when the river comes up again. So we need to embrace this self-empowerment in terms of dealing with issues like flood and issues like biodiversity. Was there another question? Uh, just at the at the back there, there was the, the two hands up. Yeah, and the lady in front of you. Um, and thank you, panel. Um, just to ask one question: We have this scheme in the Department of Agriculture called the Native Woodland Scheme. Um, works very closely with Woodlands of Ireland and Inland Fisheries and National Parks for Wildlife. And the idea is that it funds the development of new native woodland using ecological principles and also converting. For example, conifer to native woodland at key pinch points um, where there might be issues around water quality, that type of thing. And what I'd like to ask is, knowing that we have this package and it's been there for 16, 17 years, it's evolving all the time, there's over a thousand people trained in its use, for example, uh, working very closely with Woodlands of Ireland in many aspects of it, how can we ramp it up? Um, it's been mentioned that native woodland is, can be used as, as one of the tools in terms of flood mitigation how to identify areas in the landscape that would benefit from native woodland creation uh, for this purpose, and then, if you like more critically, how to knock on the door of the landowner and to say to that person, you know, um, how about this? <laughs> so it's quite a, quite a wide-ranging question, but it's just how to identify the areas in the landscape that would benefit from native woodland creation for flood mitigation, and then how to engage with the, uh, the people who own the land to, to go this route. Maybe Siobhan is a, it was engaging with people a lot. Have you thought? Yeah, I was actually distracted. I was reading the questions. They <laughs> were flying up. I wasn't even listening to the question. Sorry. It's about engaging with engaging with communities uh, and, and how do we do that? And, and uh, well, our our team are currently having public meetings in priority areas for action. So there's a series of 190 meetings going on throughout the country. So that's one way of engaging farmers in particular coming to those meetings. So. And when they see the maps up on the wall of the priority areas and they see how it affects them, that they're part of the plan and their, their stretch of river will be walked and it will be tested and the finger will be pointed effectively. So that makes them want to mm -hmm. engage and to act. But I think to engage community groups, it's all about giving them incentives, giving them awards, mm -hmm. giving them grants. Okay. Um, um, so there I seems to be a few questions uh, coming to headed towards the OPW's direction. Yeah, had something to yeah, I, oh, wait, yeah, part, I just sorry. Had on that point. Um, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, for the first time in my life, I was approached by the farmers uh, due to the level of, of, of erosion that they were experiencing. And I met a range of generations, and that's how I was able to connect with them. And, and they admitted their mistakes. They are not their mistakes, their, their inability to actually cope, because they, they, they're proud people. They want to be able to fix things within their own system. But what that led on to was that 
we started to discuss buffer zones. We started to discuss coppicing. We started to discuss revenue from hazel and ash uh, through the community fuel uh, systems. Um, and then that grew within my head of, of when I, every time I see that map of the River Noor, uh, to use a Star Trek analogy, I want to cloak it. I want a cloaking device around that whole catchment. And we have to evolve to a point where we have that 25 meter cloak around every single piece of water in our land. And then we can manage it for light. Then we can manage it for, and it will work in the context of, of flood alleviation. It will work in the context of biodiversity. But the landowners, it, it, it would be much easier to approach them because they, their land is being destroyed. So there is already a narrative there to, to approach these people, and I think it, it, the time to strike is, is now. And often to actually show them the examples is Absolutely. very effective as well, to mm -hmm. have talks, mm -hmm. to bring them in to say this is the best practice and to give them ideas. Okay, there was, uh, you had your hand up there. This, uh, you can't actually see On the same theme, I was just wondering if there are good examples um, that the panel could maybe cite um, around uh, the slow flow um, the natural flood retention measures um, where communities have engaged and particularly landowners whose land is going to flood to maybe protect a town or village downstream, you know, that when you're slowing flow in the upper catchment, how do you convince a farmer that that's, that's you know, of benefit if it's not of benefit for him, but it's benefit mm -hmm. downstream? Uh, so th there's loads of um, uh, examples from the United Kingdom and from the broader European area in Germany and the Netherlands, etc., there isn't really one in Ireland mm. because we haven't deployed it yet, but we're on our way to getting it to go. I think your question around how do you convince people um, is a really good one. And this is something culturally I think that I've hit in Ireland in terms of the, the farming attitude to their land. And I would advocate that we now start to think of communities as catchment communities because we seem to have this rural and uh, village community uh, psyche going on, and we need to break that down. And you don't go in and tell or convince farmers. You work with them and villagers from the ground up. You co-design any approach. They are far more knowledgeable of the local conditions, and this is a local-based condition system. You can't take a model and deploy it in any area. You have to work with that specific area, the specifics of the people and the landscape. I have time for one more uh, question. Uh, I just, you, you had your hand up there for a second. Sorry. You know, don't fight it out. <laughs> Maybe we'll take both questions. Is that all right? Is it, if there? Um, I suppose. Yeah. Would be, I was just wondering about. You know, you've talked about coppicing, but what would be the general approach about you know farmland and gen or land in general being just completely open plain of monoculture of crops, and you know encouraging the, that slowing down within the land, not just in the buffer zones along the rivers, but actually within. The, you know, say the 30 acre site, you know, that's just under grass cover, just having buffer zones within that of planting. You see fields now and they're just tree, or, you know, there isn't a tree to be seen in the whole field at all, except for maybe on the edges. So, you know, just slowing down and, and leaving areas at the edge of the land, you know, where every inch of land's under cultivation, maybe leaving some areas as buffer zones again within the landowner's own land catchment area. So buffer, buffer zones and... But buffer zones within and the land, not just along the river, but actually within um, the footprint of the land owned by a person themselves as well. Okay, well, and can I get your question as well? Just My question is... Is this on? No? Yes. Oh, it is, yeah. Uh, I'd like to know the panel's view on where habitat restoration fits into all of this, especially habitat restoration in our uplands, which is one of our biggest water attenuation features. I'm from National Parks and Wildlife Service, and... Uh, our, our upcoming Article 17 report is going to be more bad news for our uplands. Our blanket bogs in particular are significantly degraded, but that, those uh, habitats attenuate water, mm -hmm. and Inishon is a fantastic example of that. Uh, those hills were burned the, in advance of that flood event, and many of them are also shockingly overgrazed. Where do you see habitat restoration coming into, into play when it comes to slowing water flow and attenuating water? Okay, so who would like to handle buffer zones and oh, restoration? Uh, hand in hand. They go together. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's both... It's a, it's a co-benefit. It's a natural co It will happen naturally. Mm -hmm. If you're slowing down flow, you're retaining water, so you're creating a habitat there, and you're helping to restore that environment if it needs restore, restoration. I, I would also say that um, we, 
visually need to see our uplands. We, we need to get used to them having trees again. It's something that we actually don't associate with our uplands in this country because we don't have any trees other than conifers. And, you know, I was very fortunate to work in, on the Cara system in Kerry um, and Donegal and, and, and parts of, of, of uh, Sligo and Mayo. And where you get those rare patches of trees within our upland environment, um, not only are they stunning to see, not only is the biodiversity incredible, but we are not used to seeing. And we need more projects where we actually are uh, naturally um, uh, uh, forcing through colonisation, pre preferably of our upland areas. And we're looking at a number of sites where we're looking to do that um, and, and to fence off particular tributaries of particular rivers. I can't go into details at the minute, but to create um, that visual that people actually see uh, trees within an upland environment because it, it, it's not even part of our conscious anymore. Thank you. And, and uh, from my own point of view, I'd like to see the beaver brought back. So would I. Um, uh, simply because... Say, that European guidance, that natural water retention measure, the EU Commission guidance, there's a lot of stuff on the website. Yep. Like all, all the yes. things you mentioned, you know, they're all yeah. measures, they're all given codes, yep. numbers and yep. such. There's maybe kind of 50 different we things. We have some very good uh, rewilding so experiments in the UK and in, in parts of Scandinavia and all over Europe where the, where the beaver is on. The problem is the beaver doesn't stay where it's put and uh, can cause problems further downstream. Um, maybe uh, if I can get one more question then. Uh, sorry, this sorry, it's a long one here. And, uh, We'll then, I think we're, we're being ushered out head down to the break. We'll have one final one. Thanks. Yes, uh, um, I, I'm an organic farmer, and maybe, uh, maybe I can direct this question to the Department of Geography. Um, I, I see um, you know, farming practice and compaction of the, of the ground through animal numbers and, and I suppose, uh, maybe declines in uh, earthworm populations through the systems of farming. And so I, I wonder, uh, in terms of trying to slow the movement, of water from the catchment, you know, can we be prescribing uh, systems that will support the earthworms, also as well as the trees, as that was mentioned earlier. So maybe a pilot on, on something like that, would you think might be a, a good uh, idea? I love the idea. I think yes, exactly, and it is part of the the broader uh, natural water retention is to not retain it as surface water, but as subsurface as well. Increase the permeability of the soil, which has been compacted by the animals and by the vehicles over it. You have these systems where you can drag behind a, a tractor these spiky big wheels and they put in, they make the soil more permeable. And to do that at a certain time of year, but every year, increases the permeability and it slows down the flow. You increase the moisture, water retention in the soil. Good idea. Uh, thank you very much. I'm afraid we have run, run our course, uh, so to speak. Um, sorry for the pun. Uh, thank you very much everybody for attending and uh, we're taking a short break and there's a plenary session starting I think it's at four o'clock at the in the in the main hall again so just like us to thank all our presenters um, for giving us their time thank you very much <laughs> <laughs>